My apologies, Mr. Labonge, and I know Mr. Blumenfield is around here somewhere for being late. Uh, let us begin with, uh, today is Wednesday, October 1st, 2014. We have the Energy and Environment Committee here. We're joined by Mr. Labonge. I know Mr. Blumenfield's on his way. Mr. Prieto, what do we have first? Mr. Chair, you have five-item agenda. The first item is a sewer service charge appeal for the property located at 7646 Memory Drive in Tonga, California. Very yeah. good. Uh, is staff available to present on item number one? Are we going to continue that, Lisa? Yes, would you like a quick report? Yes, please. Lisa Maori, Sanitation. Uh, this particular sewer service charge case uh, is a case where the customer was not connected to the sewer, so they are due a refund. Uh, however, it got a little bit complicated because during part of the period, there were actually two names on the account. For the entire time when there was our only one name on the account, the refund has been made, all of that's been dealt with, but there was a, a couple of years where there were two names on the account. So the requirement is that both people whose name is on the account have to apply. Uh, so far, we've only had the one person apply, and that's the appellate in this case. However, after multiple tries, we have finally gotten in contact with the other customer um, who previously has not agreed to submit a claim form. However, we have finally talked her into submitting a claim for this. So we are requesting a continuance. Um, two meetings, I think, would be sufficient. We should be able to work everything out with the other customer whose name on the, is on the account and be able to process this without further action. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Mary. We're going to go ahead and hold that item, and we'll continue it to the next one. Item number two. Item number two. Pure sanitation report, relative proposed plan for the citywide abandoned waste cleanup program. You have staff from the Bureau of Sanitation, as well as a presentation. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello, Javier Polanco, Bureau of Sanitation. Uh, I just wanted to start off this uh, meeting to just showcase the, uh, all the hard work that uh, the Bureau of Sanitation has uh, put in to uh, keep the uh, uh, alleys, uh, alleyways clean in this program. Uh, the leadership of the City Council and the Mayor have found it necessary to rid the city of uh, accumulated blight after years of may or maybe decades of neglect by opening the door for sanitation to tackle this daunting task. Uh, we're we're going to go through this presentation and with your approval to move the $5 million in the unappropriated balance to the LA San budget, we can preserve the gains that we've achieved through the cleanup efforts over the past uh, fiscal year. Uh, in the short term, LA San uh, commits to stopping the bleeding and continuing to chip away at the edges of this problem so that at the very least it doesn't grow any worse. And in the medium term, after obtaining key metrics on the quantities and types of service requests and response times, we can uh, develop a baseline of data to report on the ad adequacy of the resources committed. Um, LSN can determine the uh, uh, level of resources to operate uh, in a maintenance mode. We want to get to that maintenance mode where major accumulations of debris uh, are mitigated and we are fo fixing that broken window in quicker order. So the, the, this alleyway here, we pulled out about 55 tons of material out of one alley. And uh, the crews did such a great job. It's like broom clean if you look over to the right after you know, sanitation cleaned this up. It's like a three-block alley of just accumulated uh, debris in the alley. And so uh, they've just done a great job in uh, being able to, to uh, clean up these areas. And we just, uh, we don't want it to reverse to prior conditions. You know, we really want uh, to be able to uh, continue this work. There's, the residents really appreciate it. They've come out, you know, in tears, thanking sanitation that some of us cares to uh, clean their alleys, thanks to uh, City Council and Mayor's office to uh, let us do this. So let me go back. I, I had to play this first to make sure that it played, you know, so I'll go back to the beginning. The 
sanitation bulky item uh, pickup service. Uh, we pick up household uh, furniture, mattresses, and appliances uh, by appointment. That, that's uh, within the services that we normally provide, and the residents call either 311 or our, our 800-773-CITY uh, number to schedule appointments to pick up uh, bulky items uh, that include furniture, mattresses, and appliances. Uh, last year, uh, through the Keep It Clean campaign program in uh, CD1, uh, Council Member Gilbert Cedillo introduced a motion directing sanitation to form a comprehensive program to address blight. Um, LA, LA Sanitation initiated the pilot program offering dedicated and enhanced uh, sanitation services that did, did make quite a bit, bit of difference in uh, the district in terms of uh, reducing blight in the area. Here are just some uh, before and after shots uh, along uh, Venice Boulevard between Bonnie Raid Street and Burlington Avenue. This is an example of an abandoned waste location on uh, Foothill Boulevard in Balboa. Um, so you can either have an alleyway or, or some other areas where there's uh, abandoned waste in that location. In terms of the budget, um, Mayor uh, Eric Garcetti of the City Council allocated $5 million uh, in fiscal year 14-15 in the LA sanitation, but, um, for LA Sanitation to do citywide cleanups of abandoned waste. And the funds were allocated for removal of abandoned waste uh, in alleys, uh, maintenance of alleys after initial cleanups, and uh, removal of waste from sidewalks. Uh, we were asked to report back to City Council with a proposal dealing how the five million would be uh, utilized. And how, how it would be utilized, uh, we have uh, 15 council uh, districts, of course, and we would have one, day to, uh, one dedicated day of service per uh, council districts because we have two crews uh, that, that uh, each crew would uh, be available for 20 days for a total of 40. So if you have uh, 15 days for the dedicated uh, uh, days for the council districts to uh, choose what type of service cleanup they need, we'd have a balance of uh, 25 days rotating service. Uh, so we'd maintain some flexibility because there, there are times when the cleanups are quite involved and they stretch out in, in, into more than just one day. And then there's... Um, you know, the, the severity of a cleanup that might need um, more uh, more immediate attention, having those rotating days, because that seems to happen at times where there's an immediate cleanup that, that needs to happen, and having that flexibility, we can uh, deploy the crews that, that way uh, when we have that flexibility on the rotating days, because there's all types of uh, materials that can be uh, pulled out of uh, these alleyways. And we do have a... Um, shared Google Doc uh, spreadsheet that um, we're sharing with each of the council districts so they can uh, choo choose and prioritize um, the cleanups uh, that go on in their district. So between our staff and, and uh, the council district office, they dedicate a person to be able to, to look through um, the requests that are, that are in the queue. This is just the uh, example of uh, the schedule days um, and how we would have to make adjustments, at, you know, for the for holidays. When we have holidays, then the service would, you know, be, be deferred into, until uh, the next day. But uh, you, you have a schedule there um, before you, um, but you have the, the one dedicated day uh, each month, and, and then those rotating days um, to, based on uh, the demand that that would come in. Um, wanted to also set up a uh, LA Sandstat uh, type of program that would be similar to uh, LAPD's uh, um, CompStat program where uh, they track uh, the different types of crimes and the number of crimes that they have in their district, different uh, areas that, that they police. Well, we, we in turn would want to uh, track the different type of service requests for cleanup uh, that would go on in each of the council districts, how long it would take to uh, um, service those types so that we'd have some metrics and we could uh, develop a baseline set of data so we'd know uh, going forward um, if we'd have adequate resources uh, uh, going into the following year. Uh, 
Uh, this is a layout here of the uh, position requests. Um, we would have uh, six maintenance laborers, uh, six refuse collection operators. Um, we would uh, share a wastewater collection worker with another program. Um, and uh, we'd have uh, some super supervisory staff as well uh, um, to, to support the program. Sanitation is recommending that the, uh, there be approval of the citywide clean streets plan and that uh, the $5 million uh, be appropriated from the unappropriated balance to the Alley Sam budget and, uh, for, for, uh, and also that we could have the, the, you know, the, the position approval as well um, be expedited. This is just a look at the budget here. We did have a, uh, a revision uh, to the budget. Uh, we, we submitted an amended report where uh, the, re the, the amount didn't change, uh, but uh, the, uh, we had adjustment in the cap rate that, uh, that we had to make. There was a revision that we wanted to make sure we had the most updated cap rate uh, applied. Um, and with that, there was um, a surplus that we thought would uh, benefit us in that we don't really have any contingencies with this with this budget and this would allow you know that that surplus uh, to be able to have overtime that way if a crew is out in the field at the end of the at the end of their job if you know if they could just stay a couple hours to finish it up we'd have some overtime available we also have contractual services because many times there's has this way so we have to pull out uh, of these alleys, alleyways and such, and so we'd have, uh, uh, you know, the Clean Harbors contract to be able to address. We'd have more, uh, you know, money for that, and as well as uh, tip fees to extend the program, because this is initial year of the program. We're not quite sure just how, how far um, the budget will go, but this will allow some measure of contingency. Right. That, that, uh, that concludes my our presentation. Mr. LaBonge. Yeah, just a couple of things. The first thing I want us to do, and I see the general managers here uh, for that, is to develop LA Sand CSI. We're not going to get to the bottom of this unless you have CSI. A lot of those alleys, a lot of the commercial waste in my old district, and I lost it in redistricting, Duran Street was the number one dump street in the city off the freeway in a cul-de-sac next to the LA River. But I think, members, it's real important. If we really want to get, I hate to use this term, the bottom of it, we've got to have some tough uh, enforcement. Is there a city attorney in the house? Not a city attorney here. So tough enforcement by the city because it's going to keep piling up. The reason why there's so much on the street is there's no respect for the city. And so consequently, people dump. I got that. But I do think we need a CSI. So whatever we do, you know what CSI is? Yeah. It's like on Channel 2 or Channel 4, and they're uh, young people, and they bust people for That's doing bad things. Yeah. We want to bust people for littering. Yeah. And there's not a city of two. Is there a policeman in the office here? In the, no police officer? There's a traffic officer who's a police officer. But I, how many littering uh, tickets have you written in your career, officer? Okay, all right, I, I rest my case. Okay, thank you very much. No. Mr. Mr. Thank you, officer. I think, I think it's a great idea, yeah. and what we should do is, oh, I'm going to ask that this come back in three months so that right. we can see the metrics, because the Los Angeles Police Department has something called a VST. Right. You know what that is? Volunteer Surveillance Team. Right. What they do is they will, uh, if we cater some programs to look at either street racing, but in this case, illegal dumping, where we know that we've got hot spots. They could put it up on a telephone pole, boom. Well, yeah. and, and actually have volunteers do the surveillance. Right. We've done right. it. I've done it a couple of times on illegal street, street racing. And there's no reason why we couldn't do that with illegal dumping. I just think public works should do that. Further on to this, is this a $5 million citywide? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, I also think we should take a planning map. Density is a big issue. Where the densest neighborhoods are, you have the more bulky items. Again, in my old district, uh, between Hoover and 3rd and, and, and Wilshire, and western, heavy, most densely populated area of our city, west of Manhattan, west of the second most densely populated area, they're just people just dump it. 
And then once you dump it, it is. Everybody should read the Broken Windows concept by James Q. Wilson. Do you subscribe to Broken Windows, Mr. Koretz? I actually, I was uh, implementing that in West Hollywood about 25 years ago, when it, whenever it first came out. And West Hollywood is 1.9 square miles, and it's the cleanest 1.9 square million miles in the, in the region. We have a big area, so that's our challenge. The other thing I wanted to say, what I have done, is about four or five years ago, I uh, bought a truck, and I got a deputy, and we hire Conservation Corps, young people, to just do it, and we work with... Uh, Peppy and everybody in your yards, and we dump in some yards, mostly they're more friendly in street services yards because I think it, they lost their spot cleaning crews, so it, it helps. But the palm fronds, all the stuff that stays on the street, I think there's a big science to this. And uh, you know who is Mr. Back to Basics? Other than Felipe Fuentes? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, yeah. you got it. Okay. Who had that first, you or the mayor? Oh, the mayor. Sure. Very good, very good. He's a smart man, <laughs> Felipe. Longer, yeah. That's for sure. This is a basic service, but it's, uh, but it's been a real serious situation uh, for the quality of life, and it has a whole determination. And there's nothing like a big green Los Angeles Bureau of Sanitation truck. And uh, I, I would also like to say, too, even if you ran them, uh, I love the Beatles, their song, Eight Days a Week. If you ran things eight days a week, just there's enough out there. Now, it's different than the, the skip loader that has to come to pick up some of that alley stuff. But just going through the densely populated areas and, and to break the, the pattern of that, we did put a small fee on the, uh, on the apartments to pay for this. So I want to see how that's going as far as that. But I would encourage, too, if I was uh, recommend any new council person, uh, you got a lot of deputies, you got a lot of legislative deputies and thinkers. Get somebody who wants to just pick up a, a piece of bulky out and it makes the constituents happy. When they could call and get immediate service, that's real important. So this is a very important step on this. Some of the other areas of the city have it more deeply. It's all based on density uh, and other issues as well. That is, uh, should be looked at, but I think it would be a very good thing. And the other thing, too, that I do want to hear from sanitation, ultimately, are we ever going to do trash to energy at all? Is that a thing in the past? It's item. A coming next item. Second item. There's, Second there's, item. There's another item. All right, good. Yeah. All right, we're going to hear that. Thank you so much, Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Mr. CSI. Thanks. Uh, well, first, Mr. Blanche, it's a great idea what you have with your with uh, getting that excess truck. And in fact, I stole that idea from you. I want to make it clear it was your idea that we stole and, and implemented in my own district. Uh, we've got a truck that we go out and we help out when we hear bulky items and everything else. So thank you for the, uh, for the idea and for there's no plagiarism in, in politics, so we, you know, we take ideas liberally. But uh, I'm man of the year in West Valley, I think, this uh, April because of that, I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and this is a great program. I mean, and I'm, I'm really thrilled that you're doing this, and it's, it's great for all the council districts. And I wanted to both agree with my, my colleagues talking about more enforcement as being part of the key. Uh, but the other piece, which is not necessarily part of this program, but is, is the educational aspect. You know, part of the reason people dump is because, you know, some people just want to do something, just get rid of their stuff, and they don't know what to do about it. Uh, and some people are, are consciously breaking the law. I mean, one of the things we do in my district, when I, when I see a dumping site, we, we then do a letter and we try to s send it out to the folks in the immediate area because a lot of times the dumping is done by folks who live nearby. Um, and so the question is also not only how do we enforce it, which we need to do, mobile cameras and things like that are all great, but how do we, when we see that there's a problem, how do we better educate the people who live in the immediate community to know that there are other options to get rid of your sofa. You just call up and you can get your bulky item picked up. So I just wanted to put that out there. It's something I, I look forward to continuing to work with, with you all on in terms of the education component, maybe getting a standard letter from the council office that can go you know, to the immediate area, you know, even wider spread than, than we do on, on sort of an ad hoc basis in my office would be a, a good way to go about it. But basic point here, love the program, love what you're doing here excited about moving it forward and, and having it done in all the districts. Thank you. Mr. Kretz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I guess I must lead a sheltered life and not hang out in the right alleys in the city, but I've never seen anything quite like that. Uh, I don't think we have any alleys in my district where you could dig up 
tons of stuff. I feel terrible for the people that have to have to deal with that, and I think this is a brilliant idea to uh, improve the quality of life and clean up some of these neighborhoods. Um, and I'm particularly proud of uh, Gilbert Cedillo, who's been a good friend of mine long before he got into politics, and I'm really proud that he came up with this program to uh, to make a huge difference in neighborhoods. Um, I was going to make a similar point on, on education, and uh, I think maybe we should even look at some signage for uh, areas that, that have become uh, you know, entrenched as dump sites once we've cleaned them up if, uh, if they continue to be a problem, which they may not be. Uh, it's possible that you make this kind of a, a sea change in a neighborhood and people will realize that uh, you know, dumping the first uh, bed or whatever it is back into that area that that looks so pristine, I think it may it may take care of itself to some degree. But if the problems continue, uh, putting some signage I think might be helpful too. Because I think it it is a fair point that people see it and they say, well, it must be okay, everybody else is doing it. Um, if you let people know what the alternatives are and you let them know that it's not okay and you do some enforcement, uh, I think you'd really resolve this problem. Um, an incredible program. I'm really excited, and I think this will make a, 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 a huge difference in neighborhoods. And as we said with the broken windows, you you start to improve uh, some of those uh, issues that are visible, and you improve uh, the entire community, and you drop crime, and, and you make a lot of positive changes. So really exciting. Any way I can be supportive of this, uh, I certainly will. Thank you. Very good. So. Uh, Mr. Chair, are you going to, you said continue this or no? no. So, so the idea here, colleagues, would be to uh, move the item to budget and finance because there are some significant revisions to their budget, the $5 million and how it's being spent, uh, so that hopefully they would approve it and move it to the full city council. Yeah. I'm going to then ask the department to come back in three months to help us understand the metrics and the information that they're finding because I think a couple of key points were made here in terms of needing to really figure out how to educate locations uh, about whether it's the 199 letters that Mr. Blumenfield and I sent to our constituents or whether it's uh, signage. Uh, but what I heard from Mr. Koretz is that CD5, you can drop that from your list. You don't need to go there. Uh, but everywhere else in the uh, city, uh, there are some challenges. I don't know if you have any questions. Yeah, I, I just, um, you know, the, in, in Koretz's point is, is interesting because there are certain parts of the city that um, needs more of this than others. It's just a fact. Uh, and, um, you know, we are limited in some parts of the city as to how often we can do this. So this is great that we're doing this. One thing that we started with the expansion of Operation Healthy Streets is for homeless encampments that we work with LASA and the county to get social services go out and ask the individuals if they need any type of service. And interestingly enough, uh, the county social workers who went out there with us the very first time we did the expanded Operation Healthy Streets, a county worker told us it's the first time in her 30 years that the city and the county were working together at the street level to not allow the city to do its job, which is clean the streets, but allow the county to do its job with providing social services. The, uh, it was a huge success. The number of people we put in shelter, we got some enrolled in Medi-Cal. We uh, actually got some that needed immediate mental services. Um, and I'm just wondering that we're doing this in skid row now, but in other parts of the city, as we go out to clean more homeless encampments, can we do this there with LASA? That's the plan with the $5 million, is that we, the uh, skid row was allocated $3 million. Citywide, we have $5 million, and we have larger area, but the procedures we're using on skid row will be implemented okay. citywide. But LASA would need additional funding, because uh, through Operation Healthy Streets, we allocated some funding to LASA to be able to provide this service. So uh, is that being accounted for in the five million for LASA to be able to do that? Not no, in the five is, uh, no. Uh, Mr. Weiser, so in the block grant uh, uh, portion uh, in Mr. Cedillo's committee, in fact, that's where I think a lot of the LASA contribution from the city has been done. This uh, is five million dollars programmatically strictly for sanitation. Uh, but I understand your point and, and hopefully the block grant contributions that we're making uh, more than sort of help 
Uh, but just to re refresh people's memory, there's $3 million that's being allocated to the Skid Row location, and it was $3 million also to the Venice area. About uh, 500,000. How much was it? 500,000. 500,000, yeah. 500, and then this 5 million to be a citywide effort. Yeah, but there is no money allocated of the 5 million to LASA to do their social services. Not in the 5 million. No, not on this program. Oh. I know they're limited dollars in what we can do, but um, Operation Healthy Streets, we did use some of those dollars to LASA to help us with social services, correct? And I'm just wondering, it was hugely successful there. Why don't we uh, replicate that when we go to other... So in Skid Row, we're going to have uh, LASA go out two weeks prior to us cleaning up, ask them if they need help, get people the services they need. Other parts of the city, we're not replicating that and doing the same thing there when we've shown that it's very successful over here. I'm just wondering, can we work with that to do the same thing? For example, right now we just cleaned up the Arroyo Seco, uh, both in my district and City One. Huge encampments in our parks. They were there for months. We finally went out there and cleaned them up. But I noticed that we didn't do the same thing as Skid Row, where we cleaned them up, but we just moved on the homeless individuals. But we had contact with them. We should have had, that's a great opportunity for us to work with LASA and get some of those people the services they may need. I just, I'm wondering if we could look at the dollars here and do the same thing we've been doing in Skid Row citywide. Councilmember Weiser, Enrique Zaldivar, Director of Sanitation. I hate it when a council member shows up late and throws a wrench into the <laughs> shop. <laughs> but, but, but I think there's a good answer for what you, you have in mind. Not a wrench, a couch. A couch. <laughs> <laughs> The idea of the homeless encampments in the context of the citywide proposal that we have here, the Clean Streets Program, is that homeless, uh, the homeless issue is very incidental uh, to the program and the core of the program. It's rarely that we encounter a homeless encampment. So it's not intended to be a homeless uh, kind of outreach or any kind of other program. It's basically a cleanup effort. Uh, not, whereas Skid Row and Venice is clearly a homeless focus yeah. program. So this is interesting. So we're not seeing the types of encampments in other parts of the city other than what's well, no longer just in Skid Row and downtown. It's moving on to Chinatown, El Pueblo. Uh, and we had incidents in Ball Heights next to General Hospital where the yeah. hospital should be doing its job and be offering people services instead of just releasing them out, of, out the door. Um, so there's encampments there, there's encampments in other parts. We're, we're not really seeing that anywhere else. We, Hollywood maybe, Venice. There are instances when we have these encampments. I see more and more of these encampments. We do encounter up. them, but they're incidental. They're not uh, the program itself nor the uh, occurrence is uh, primary as it is in Skid Row. That's, that's the difference. So okay. the funding is primarily around the, the, just the basic cleanup. We do encounter the homeless encampments, and we go through the protocol the same way we would um, uh, under any of the similar circum circumstances, but not where it is tailored okay. as okay. a homeless outreach. Yeah. I, okay. Well, because we're moving, we're just moving the homeless encampment to another place where I think if we use a model from Skid Row, we could probably get those people some assistance and help and lessen it. You know, instead of saying, hey, we're going to come clean here, move on, we could probably lessen it by getting those, some of those people uh, I think off part the of what the, the chair uh, has, has requested is that when we come back, uh, part of what the data that we will show you is, you know, what is the incidence of occurrence of one type of over the other? And I think you will have an opportunity to see how things are. Okay. Uh, and the answer I heard from you today is that it is a problem, but it is, I mean, resources are scarce, we're dedicating them to clean up as much as we can around. The encampments that we see are not as much right. citywide to say, hey, we're going to put a lot of this limited resources into that. We're going to start. That's okay. correct. Understood. Thanks. Well, I, I actually think that the encampments are probably even just as big as this. This is, you know, to just back up the sanitation for a second. Um, you know, I've got the same problems in CD7 where I've got tremendous alleys and dumping locations like you saw on the screen, but I also have uh, really big encampments, Tahunga Wash, Hanson Dam. We worked very successfully, borrowing a page from your book, uh, with LASA to go out there and do service delivery and then followed by a cleanup 
uh, and some enforcement. And that cycle's uh, going back and forth. My hope is that this cleanup uh, program, which, by the way, uh, formalizes what the sanitation department doesn't have in place right now. The bulky items are done ad hoc, and, uh, and it's, they're doing a tremendous job, but this is going to be a formalized program to do all of that. And in their research, hopefully it'll inform us how much we've got to go out there and deal with homeless encampments relative to bulky items. Yeah, and so I think what we're going to find, and probably assuredly is going to be the need for additional resources to, to deal with both of those issues. Um, the metrics you're talking about, when we come back, we could look at that yes. and see what You'll remember, I think initially they had asked for $26 million to sort of do it <laughs> yeah. right, uh, and we're going to do what we can with $5 million. Uh, yeah. And so, which is why we want uh, the Budget and Finance Committee to really sort of vet the five million dollars so that when they start this program formalize their efforts and come back we hopefully have a real uh, sort of sound way to deal with all of this including the encampments because my guess is that that's just as expensive and not more uh, than just the bulky item part and thank you and I'm, I'm just questioning I'm thinking aloud here I think sanitation is doing a tremendous great job given the limited resources um, and like I said there's some communities that are most more impacted than this than others for example apartment buildings uh, people move more often and sometimes move you know depending on the type of housing they move quickly and out and some people may not be able to afford moving fees and all that stuff and just right. um, leave their they belongings in the in the streets and so other some communities are impacted more than than others and what we've done in my district is we have contracted with some local uh, nonprofit organizations to assist us in additional cleanups there but it is not for the lack of great work you guys it was just there's so much of it and the limited resources you guys have to do it but um, thanks for the work you guys do along that vein uh, mr. Saldivar can you help us identify what heavily impact it is I mean how is it that you all are gonna there, I imagine that there's great uh, demand citywide but how are you gonna sort of target the initial sort of uh, run at this, uh, the, the heavily impacted areas? Is it going to be driven by what you get from your 1-800 number? Is it going to be driven by a council office? Is it going to be driven by 311? How are you going to sort of cue your work here? Alex, you, uh, yeah. I, can, I can respond. To well, that, you know, we, the basic services, each council office will get one day a month. The 25 floating days is the one that allows us it's really a program that we're working together as a sanitation, working with the council office. Because the council deputies, as we were doing these briefings, really know the, the ins and out of each community. And they can tell us which area needs to be attended to. Uh, we have great supervisors. We have great manager, Leo Martinez. We have Pablo, who is Valley. He knows every nook and cranny in the district. But also the, the council deputies have their pulse on the community. Right. And through the through this Google Doc, they're able to put down the areas they want us to focus on. So if areas say, this is our priority for this day, and we wanted to work on a calendar, so this way each council office would know from now to the end of the year, which day of the, actually till next year probably, know what day of the month we're going to be in that council office. So they can put that on the document and we can coordinate the supervisor and the superintendent job as part of this program we're working for Leo is that they are in, in constant and daily communication with the council offices, getting the feedback and saying, okay, this area was cleaned up, this is how many tons we picked up, and this is what we did with the material. So this way when the LA Sand stat comes up, we'll be able to tell in each area what we picked up. So just click on the map and you see what's on it. That's the type of level and service we really want to be providing. But it's really us and you working together to clean up the community. Very good. Well, uh, uh, on that note, uh, we're going to go ahead, if it's okay with you colleagues, to approve the, uh, the plan, refer the funding allocation and related program budget proposal to Budget and Finance Committee for review, and instruct the Bureau to report back to the committee in three months with an update on program implementation, including data collection and metrics. And I would also ask you all to uh, reach out to LAPD so we can start talking about the volunteer surveillance team effort to start uh, attacking this from both prongs, one, from cleaning up, and two, from trying to figure out how to catch these folks who are, uh, are, are doing this sort of thing. Okay. Without objection, that's Yeah, just to you. add one quick thing. Yeah, you were right on, Alex, on the field deputies. Your field deputies are your strongest proponents. 
And Mr. Fuentes, when you mentioned the LAPD, they had Operation Sparkle, they had a lot of things. Maybe we could arrange a meeting with the Office of Operations, which has the senior leads in it, and then we coordinated it. The trouble with the boundaries, like per district, my, my district has boundaries that are you know, not contiguous to what is a regular neighborhood. So maybe you do the Hollywood planning area, like by large areas, in, in the same, up to where your boundary is on, is it La Brea for the west and the east? Right. You know, something like that. So we could work it, but it makes sense to be, if you're in there and across the street is the 13th district and there's a couch, don't keep it an orphan. Yeah. Pick it up. So we've got it. Very good. Without objection, that shall be the order. Uh, item number four. Item number four, Mr. Chair. DWP, CAO, OPA reports an ordinance for alternate proposed Springbok 1 solar farm power sales agreement, agency agreement with SCAPA as well as license agreement to, in connection with the purchase of solar energy. You have staff from DWP, CAO, and the OPA. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Webster. I'm assistant director of our power system planning and development organization. And just very briefly, I wanted to uh, introduce the Springbok 1 project to you. Uh, several months ago, we came to you with an overall strategy on building a renewable energy corridor in and around the Mojave area. Just 20 miles north of Mojave, we have our Barren Ridge substation. And in Barren Ridge, we have our Pine Tree Wind Farm, our Pine Tree Solar Project. Uh, we also have a couple of projects that were recently uh, approved, the recurrent project right here, and our Beacon Solar, which is a combination of utility scale as well as a local component. And so... This project is Springbok 1 in the blue, which connects directly into the Beacon Station. There's a six-mile transmission line that would go right along the corridor of our Beacon property and connect into this new Beacon Station. And it's one of two phases. Springbok 1, is, which is why we're here today, and there's uh, two, uh, uh, Springbok 2 is a couple of other uh, projects that could be down the road. So this project's 100 megawatts. It's a single-axis tracking project. Now, why is that important? Is that... Single axis tracking gives us more capacity on those peak days. So two weeks ago when we had heavy load days, the more capacity we have, the better off we are. And this is single axis tracking. And it was selected from over 300 projects um, in our proposals. This had the best value. It has the lowest cost and best value connecting directly into our transmission system. Uh, the price for the energy under contract, this is a power purchase agreement. It is for 25 years. It has associated agreements, a lease agreement, as well as an agency agreement and a power sales agreement. But the price is $68.60. And it contributes 1.2% to our RPS. So it's a significant contributor to us hitting our goal of 25% by 2016, and then especially 33% by, by 2020. Now, 8-Minute Energy is the developer. They have experience developing other projects in California. And um, Eight Minute Energy is a Los Angeles-based uh, company. And that concludes my opening remarks, and happy to answer any questions on this project. Let's hear from the CAO and then from the ratepayer advocate. The Robert Ross CAO's office. Uh, our office has reviewed this project. We are in favor of, of approving this project. However, I wanted to note that similar to previous reports we've had on solar projects, we we observe some improvements in, in the level of communication, analysis, and support for this project in particular. We worked very closely with the CFO, with the Power System Group. Uh, we even reached out and, uh, and spoke with the developer themselves. Um, through all the analysis and the collective uh, efforts by, by both the CFO, the Finance Group, the Power System Group, including our own office, um, Revisions were made to the original proposal, and we see them as improvements. Uh, we estimate the cost savings about $19 million, or 4%, over the entire term of this uh, agreement. And uh, obviously, we support continuing these kind of uh, analysis and, and coordinated efforts to make the best projects. Um, there were other areas um, of improvement that we had suggested in our previous reports, and we're working with the department to address those in a manner possible for future projects. So in short, we do uh, recommend approval of this project. Very good. Thank you. Dr. Pickle? 
we find that this transaction is reasonable, uh, and our one uh, exception has been addressed by the the DWP board, uh, allowing uh, consideration by the DWP board if the if and when uh, DWP considers assumption of debt or purchase of this project. Very good, colleagues. Questions, Mr. Labonte? Yeah, there was a report that at some solar farms, flocks of birds get cooked. Is that true? Not this technology. Well, how about any technology in California? Uh, Just because you don't get cooked with yours, you don't think I don't care that they get cooked with others? Uh, this is a photovoltaic project, and that's not a common problem with photovoltaic projects. Is that any of DWP cooks birds? So DWP is not participating in any solar thermal projects, and it's a specific type of solar thermal technology that um, has avian concerns, especially the project out in Nevada. We are not part of it, nor any other like project. Got it. Thank you. Mr. Koretz. Yeah, this, this is a very exciting project, and I'm always glad to see another big chunk of solar power uh, the city's using. Um, I have heard a few people express concerns about the possibility that we have a very hot day in Los Angeles and there's a cool cloudy day where our solar farms are and uh, whether we would better be better off having more of a mix and also do uh, more local solar more quickly so when we have a, a hot day we have uh, solar to match it. So uh, the mix is critical for our compliance strategy, and that's why we talk a lot about geographic diversity, and we have projects in Nevada, projects around Mojave. That's why we promoted the local solar as well, to try to get 1,000 megawatts of local solar, because by having a geographic diverse, if a cloud comes over Nevada and cuts that project off, it may not be coming over Mojave. It may not come over locally. So that is a core strategy we will continue to implement. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Blumenfeld? Yeah, I'm always excited about this project, excited about solar in general. Uh, I mean, the, the, the only issue that comes up is sort of this, this longer-term rate-paying, rate-payer issue of, you know, we have to lock in rates for 20 years, and at 20 years out, of course, rates will be lower than they are, than what we're bargaining for now. But the, the theory, of course, is that by the time that we hit that point, or, you know, transition point, we'll have, we'll have more than made up for it in many respects. Can you speak to that issue in terms of how we, how we choose um, the length of time that we're, that we're uh, accounting for in terms of making this pencil out? For, so we have a variety of terms on our projects. We have projects that are 10 years. We have projects that are 20, 25. We are contemplating even a 30-year term. So uh, the most important thing for a project to pencil out is they have to have capital recovery. And so it makes a big difference on how long they have to, to pencil that out. And, you know, there's an amount of risk that if it's a 10-year term, they, they take market risk after that. So the longer the terms tend to have the best prices. And I'm not sure that prices will be lower 20 years from now. Because as markets develop, as gas price, more demand on gas, we see upward pressure on gas prices, and that pulls the entire electricity market up. However, solar should be much more competitive, but it will be pulled up in the future, and that's our prediction. We don't know if it will come true or, or not. I mean, but having a variety of terms is key, because then we can step into projects all along the course of our, our um, at least our projection over the 20 years of our integrated resource plan. You think the price of solar will go up and not? I've always, I've always taken it for granted that the price of solar will go down as, as it has with since it's technology-based and, and uh, silicone-based and everything silicone-based tends to go on Moore's Law of every seven years, all that. Um, this is the first I've heard that, that there's an expectation that the price of solar could go up. Short term, the price of solar has dropped dramatically. We're starting to see that price really stabilize out uh, from a supply and demand perspective. But we also know that all renewables are tagged to the electricity market in general. And so as electricity markets continue to, to rise, uh, that it will pull other renewables up with it. 20 years from now? We don't know what the right answer is. So the real key from a risk management perspective is to have different time periods, different technologies, so that you can have a most robust portfolio possible. Uh, 
I have a slightly different perspective. Uh, the solar technology started becoming uh, economic with fossil-fired peaking technologies when they went below about $100 a megawatt hour. And at that point, they started displacing just a little bit of the peak on an economic from the ratepayer's perspective. As prices have gone down, we've been able to displace more of the peak energy. Uh, and uh, it's our anticipation that solar will be competing with solar. Uh, and that will drive, uh, continue to drive prices lower. But this is a professional's guessing game on this front. Uh, I'd also argue natural gas prices may be dr going lower as well, but that's also a game because there may be more restrictions on the key driver for gas prices, that's fracking, and that may cause gas prices to turn around. And I guess the other thing to distinguish here is the cost of solar production versus the price of solar energy are two different things. I would hope that we would all agree that the cost of solar production is going to go down. It's just a question of if, if the market uh, is going up, then you might, the, the market price might go up, which just creates a bigger delta in terms of the, the profit that is made by the folks who own the, uh, the ability to produce solar. But I, but does anybody not think that the the cost of solar production will go down? So what we've I just want to point out to the we, issue I think. Yeah, we're giving the, the the board and council the opportunity on this project and other projects like this to have an option to own down the road, yeah. and so that gives you some ability at the end of the useful life to do something different. You can use new technologies, but we can then do the engineering, hire hire the constructor do the test and start up, and so we can participate if the actual cost is lower, we don't have to pass that cost on to a developer because we own the line, we own the transmission, and we can repurpose it. So again, from a risk perspective, we're trying to enable these types of discussions in the future. Great. Council member, uh, if I could add, uh, you're very correct in, in with respect to the cost of solar decreasing, which it has historically. I don't think there's been a period of time where it's significantly increased. Uh, but what's What's missing is that there is also fixed costs, which may not decrease just because the cost of generating solar does, such as land, the steel needed for, for brackets, transmission. Um, transmission. And some of those issues may contribute to increasing costs. However, specific to just panels themselves, we've seen them. Slowing down the rate of, in, of, rate of decrease more than increasing. Correct. And, and, and I think that's an important point because, you know, this is, uh, so it's $68.60 per megawatt. What's that a kilowatt hour? Well, 6.8 cents a kilowatt about, hour. It's about 6 cents, right? And I think it's almost 7 cents. So I think this is, you know, to Dr. Pickle's point about solar competing with solar, this is uh, a good deal for a lot of reasons. But strategically speaking as well, having been on site here and what it is that we're planning for this particular sort of tranche of solar resources and distribution, it makes it uh, a, an even better deal. And it's hard to account really from a dollar's perspective, I think, to sort of the value in all of that. But my point is that um, as we're moving forward, you know, I think it's really important for us to sort of keep our eye on that sort of dollar amount, or rather cent amount, because there are other resources that I think strategically make a lot of sense for us to consider, like in-basin, but when it's three times the price, we really need to start thinking whether we want to or should be paying as much when there's a lot of diversity out there yet to be had for large-scale solar. But, but I think it's, it's a very good point. I know Mr. Labonge wanted to... Uh, yeah, just another thing. I did have a motion. If I was to turn all the clocks of time, I wouldn't do anything for feedback tariff until we put a solar unit on every gymnasium, every schoolhouse every public library, and then worry about that, because our public institutions are, have to pay for power on this year. Do we have any program we're reaching out with our public buildings that you're doing with solar? Yeah, so what we're doing is first, DWP is trying to set an example by doing solar on our buildings and our open land. We're also in contact with the other city departments, the, the port, 
the airport, Bureau of Sanitation, who is here today, uh, as well as General Services Division, because we would love to see them participate in any one of the programs that we have, whether it's the net metered program, whether it's our utility bill, where we can come in and put the solar on every library, or even a feed-in tariff type program where they can participate in that. So we think that the entire city needs to lead the way and demonstrate that all, we're willing to put solar on our properties right. before we can ask others to put solar on theirs. Right, and the transmission cost had, was already established by traditional transmission. So eventually you're gonna have to have a replacement cost for transmission, correct? There, it, yeah, there, technically there is a limit to where you cannot put more out of basin projects without significant increases in transmission costs and then you start to balance that against something that doesn't use transmission. It starts to at least have the discussion of a level playing field. There's a ways to go, but uh, we factor all that in when we do our analysis and come to you for any approval of a local program. Well, thank you for your innovation and thank you for looking out for schools, libraries, parks, etc. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to add one component to that. The, the challenge is uh, there is a large competitive developer industry in solar. It's been in independent power for approaching 30 years. And when utilities, not just DWP, I, th I think the investor-owned utilities are worse if indications from the PUC, CEC, Padilla report is any indication. Utility-built solar and renewables are typically more expensive than competitively built projects. Very good. Colleagues, any additional questions, comments, concerns? Mr. Weiser, is this okay with you? Yes. Very good. We're, we're going to go ahead and uh, approve the Department of Water and Power's request for authority to execute a power sales agreement and agency agreement with SCAPA concerning the Springbok 1 solar farm project and related real estate license agreement as specified subject to Charter Section 607. Without, uh, that's unanimous. Very good. Thank you. My, my apologies to the folks on item three. I inadvertently skipped over that. And I'm sorry, we do have a, 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 a comment card on item number four. Uh, William Ernst Schennerwerk. Reconsider first. I believe, no, I believe my speaker card was for item four, the solar thing. I'm sorry, that's what we just, uh, we're, we're on the verge of approving that, item four. Okay, well my concern is, I did the analysis that was provided, and I assumed it was a non-tracker, but that doesn't change the numbers that much. My calculations indicate that this project will be in, well, the revenue will be two-thirds of what keep them from being in negative cash flow, and it'll end up being like Solyndra going broke very fast. Very good, thank you. Uh, with that objection, we will issue the previous order. Item number three. Item number three, Mr. Chair. Board of Public Works report relative proposed agreement with the City of Long Beach and County Sanitation Districts for partnership, ownership, and operation of the Southeast Resource Recovery Facility. Here you go, Mr. Lebon. This is your item here on uh, what we're going to do with waste. Hello, Javier Polanco, Bureau of Sanitation. Uh, we're, we are here before you today about a, a request for authority to negotiate with the City of Long Beach in LA County, LA County Sanitation Districts for a partnership in the operation and ownership of the Southeast Recovery Resource Facility, SURF, for the processing of city municipal waste. As a part of the city's uh, solid waste integrated resources plan to achieve a diversion goal of uh, 90% by 2025, sanitation is relying in part on the development of the city's first uh, commercial scale alternative technology facility project for the processing of city uh, municipal solid waste. Uh, sanitation uh, conducted a RFP selection process for an alternative technology partner and, and subsequently uh, green conversion systems was selected as the city's uh, development partner for the city's first commercial scale alternative technology uh, for processing uh, solid waste. Just some background on SURF. Uh, SURF uh, is an energy from waste facility that's been in operation for 27 years and is co-owned uh, by the city of Long Beach and LA County Sanitation Districts. The split is like 62% to 38% uh, through a joint powers agreement. Um, SURF's permitted to accept about uh, uh, 2,300 tons of waste per day and is currently accepting about 1,300 tons of uh, waste per day. Uh, sanitation 
presently brings about 100 tons per day uh, from the harbor way shed to uh, surf. Surf is located just outside of the city's southeast boundary within a half mile. Uh, the, the city's current disposal contract with uh, Republic and Sunshine Canyon Landfill um, runs through 2021. Uh, though it seems far off, uh, the contracting process uh, can extend over several years, and we want to seize the opportunity to reduce uh, the city's reliance on landfill disposal uh, to, uh, prior to expiration of that contract. Um, being that the city is actively pursuing development of an alternative uh, technology facility requiring a protracted siting process, and at the same time, the owners of SURF are, are on the uh, precipice of weighing the fate of their own facility against escalating maintenance costs and other fiscal challenges. Uh, we believe there is synergies that can be realized uh, through a potential partnership that would be of mutual benefit uh, to all entities. Uh, the city is bringing an advanced uh, technology to upgrade the facility operation to improve the air quality emission profile for this facility and the added uh, tonnage up to 1,000 uh, additional tons to maximize the capacity of the facility and the power production at the facility as well. Um, we also have in GCS uh, a partner on their team in Covanta Energy that is also happens to be the current operator at SURF. So uh, if there would be uh, some development, uh, it would provide for a seamless transition and consistency in the facility operation. So what um, Long Beach is um, uh, bringing to the table is potential equity offering and an asset that has been well maintained and is highly functioning. Uh, local alternative to landfilling for the long term and an existing site uh, cleared of planning use and uh, zoning and uh, a solid they have an existing solid waste facilities permit that's in good standing uh, the potential for a uh, for, for a less complex sequel process scoping process at, the, at this facility would uh, since it would be a retrofit of the existing uh, equipment there uh, this, we, we anticipate the CEQA would be a lot um, uh, simpler process. Um, so um, at, at this time, uh, we, we, we want to uh, seek negotiations uh, that would uh, potentially uh, benefit uh, all parties uh, in, the, in the ownership and operation of this facility. If there's any questions? Questions, colleagues? Mr. Koretz? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, has there been community outreach to the neighborhoods surrounding the plant, and do we know if there's community opposition to it, or if they even know about it? Oh, we, we do know that uh, there is community uh, support. Um, there's um, Je Jesse uh, Marquez, uh, I don't think he's here today, but uh, he leads a community group in the area, and he's uh, seen some of the uh, facilities worldwide and he's supportive of the, this type of technology. Uh, we, we also, in the SWERP process, in the Solid Waste Integrated Resources process, we've held over two, 250 stakeholder meetings. And one of the guiding principles that, come, that came out of those meetings was that they, they wanted to see a, a clean alternative technology uh, um, it, that would uh, replace uh, landfilling. So you, you had that many meetings about this one local plant? Excuse me? You had that many meetings about this one? Oh, no, not just about the one local plan, uh, plant, but just uh, the plan in general to move towards zero waste. But we haven't had, you know, this very preliminary and exploratory discussions with SERF, so we haven't had meetings about just this uh, spe uh, uh, specific um, location. But I assume those are planned with, with the community, et cetera. Yes, eventually should we, you know. Uh, enter into some type of agreement. Yes, I, that would be the plan to do a full outreach. Very good. Mr. LaBunch. Mr. Polanco, could you go to the uh, graphic uh, of the port right there on the wall to the rear? Just point for members. It's right between Long Beach and Los Angeles sure. near the Harry Briggs Bridge, correct? That's, that's correct. Right. And there's no residents within a, several miles. So... Right, and the yellow is the city of L.A. port. So it's right there, exactly. Um, thank you, Mr. Polanco. I just think these are good things. I hope we could do more 
because uh, it's it's the wave. Uh, trash to energy is a concept that's used throughout the world, and we should use more of it, less truck trips. I'd love to see Mr. Fuentes trash collected four days a week to take 586 trucks off the street, but I don't know if we could figure that out yet, but that's a goal of mine. I got nine months to see it. I don't know if I'll see it, but as long as they don't change Thursday, I'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Pratt, more another question? Thank you. Thank you. Nope. Uh, Mr. Blumenfield? Sure. Um, headed the right direction, great stuff. Uh, you know, start Thank out you. by applauding that. Um, one thing I was curious about, though, is it has to do with the, the price. I know to, to buy the best available technology new is at like 250 to 400 million dollars. So we've got this technology ingrained now. How long can we expect it to, to last? The lifespan of the technology in place, dealing with the particulates and all that, at that, that serve. We we'd assume about probably a 30-year life, but it also depends on what type of upgrades and maintenance that we. Uh, be able to uh, extend to the facility over time. You know, we'll but the uh, the authority is to negotiate with the existing operation to improve it. That's correct. Yeah. We essentially do a rehab of the facility. It's not 30 years of existing technology. It's to implement new technology if and when we were to get into an agreement with these folks. That's correct. Right. And yeah. we'll get the best possible. Great. Mr. Yeah. Weezer? Then keep up the good work on very good. So I've got a couple of questions. Uh, so renew Los Angeles 2006. The idea back then was that we would, we, the city of Los Angeles, would begin to look for seven locations of this type of conversion technology in the city of Los Angeles. And so, SURF, this is an opportunity for us to go somewhere, as Mr. Labonge astutely pointed out, that does, has very little impact, currently cited, an operation that's permitted. Great idea, but speaking to sort of what this council passed in 2006 to get to zero waste. How far along are we in the uh, Renew Los Angeles plan to, to site seven locations in the city to, with, with this type of technology? Alex, hello, uh, LA Sanitation. Uh, this is actually in line with the Renew LA. It's just taken us longer than when we hoped when the plan was initial. The plan called for seven uh, facilities throughout the city. And, and that's where you had the, one in the e outreach meetings that you mentioned earlier. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 200 plus, yeah, right. for Mr. Koretz's benefit. Okay. Continue. And I'm sorry, the Renew LA calls for one in each of the waste shed. So we have six waste sheds in the city. And so one in each of the waste sheds, this way each community will be able to handle its own waste and will not be trucking it to another community. With the seventh location could be either inside the city in a central location or outside the city. This happened to be just on the boundaries of the city. So this is, is a great start. It facility is already existing. We're only going to be improving it. And the emissions from that facility, it's already reaching city residents and outside in uh, city Los Angeles. So we're only going to be improving it. So the support that we have got at the Board of Public Works when this one came in is from those groups who really feel the city taking ownership is going to help improve the air quality for the entire Wilmington corridor area, which is impacted by truck traffics and other stuff. And I think that's an important point, that we're going to exceed the, uh, the, the emissions limits that are, not exceed, we're going to go, come far underneath the, the, what's allowed currently for the location, which is a real net benefit to, to that community. But what's your time frame for the six other locations? Because if we're going to be getting to zero waste, uh, to your point, we're going to have to set up regional locations like this. You did 200 plus meetings to that regard. Where where are we in, in siting? What's the next location going to be? Our goal to become zero waste 90% by 2025. Right now, we're about 76% diversion. Our goal is to increase the diversion through uh, using anaerobic digestions as well as composting. We believe we can reach down to about 80, 85%. With the remaining 15% of waste which is remaining out of the three million that's generated as a city, then we'll have two options. Either we use the old method, put it in landfill, have methane emission, greenhouse gases, leachate to the ground, or the other option, which is alternative technologies, which is this one. So this is a great start for us. The high heat technology. The, the waste energy technology, the one we're talking about, the advanced thermal recycling, because we're adding scrubber system, we're adding uh, reducing the NOx emission from the facilities. So once we can get this going, then we can put our look at the other options and where is the best. If we reduce the tonnage 
significantly because of the recycling, reduce, reuse, and all the other stuff we're working on, then we can look whether we need six more facilities or maybe two more facilities will do. Very good. Okay, well, we're eager to hear uh, your uh, progress to that end. Uh, so the recommendation will be to approve the report's request to authorize the director of the Bureau of Sanitation to pursue negotiations for a partnership with the City of Long Beach and the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts for co-ownership and operation of the Southeast Resource Recovery Facility, including the integration of green conversion systems, emission control technology as appropriate. Without objection, that shall be the order. That takes us to uh, item number five. Item number five. Motion, Huizar Fuentes, relative to requesting the Department of Water and Power to report on opportunities to coordinate with Central Basin Municipal Water District to expedite the delivery of recycled water. You have staff from the Department of Water and Power. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is Susan Rogani for Water Engineering Technical Services, Water System for DWP. Uh, basically, we've been meeting with Central Basin on um, this particular um, project. We've received a report from the Central Basin and they've done a preliminary study on the feasibility of getting the water from their system to the uh, Evergreen Cemetery and the other areas of East LA. Uh, we are reviewing the report. We're anticipating getting comments back to them this week. Uh, and what we will do is later on this month, we will be meeting with them to go over the comments, some of the questions we have. In the meantime, we're also evaluating our uh, particular projects in terms of being able to deliver water to the East LA area and to see if we could pull those forward. Mr. Weezer? Yes, thank you. And thank you for your attention to this matter. I, Mr. Chair, I, I ask that we continue this item in committee and allow DWP to continue working on this and to bring it back to committee at the appropriate time when more information and research is complete on this matter. Very good. That's Let's good. go ahead and continue it for 30 days. Can I ask this? To the, sure, Mr. I want to be a map. And Susan, you did a great job. Uh, last Saturday, they had over 300 people walking inside the reservoir of Silver Lake as LADWP walks and informs. Uh, and they may do that at other reservoirs throughout. Is Encino in yours, Bob? Yeah. No, but you could walk it anyway. I, you know, Mitch walked my side and we walked over. All that works. But on this issue here, I want to see the freeway system sure. adjacent to it. And also, I want to see Enrique, before he got out the door, uh, the sanitation. You're putting a big pipe through the Glendale, Los Angeles, down the Golden State, through the edge of Griffith Park, uh, where we could collaborate. Uh, I'm very proud of the beauty of Los Angeles. When it was beautiful at one time, it was really pre-1978. Uh, Caltrans absolutely had the money to have the crews beautify our parkways and our freeways. Now they don't, Mr. Fuentes, and they scramble real hard. But with Reclaim Water, maybe they can bring life back to these parkways. And I just want to see a goal. And it's probably going to take 30 years, Susan. And I don't know here who's the youngest person here I'm looking for. That would be me. That would be you. Very good. You're going to see it. So I just want to add that to it. Please have some mapping, we especially connect the Griffith Park. And, and if you want to see beauty of reclaimed water, go to Forest Lawn Drive and Zoo Drive. Uh, Bertie Grohava, who's a park uh, 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 supervisor, he designed that. And because there's reclaim, it looks like heaven. Right now, there's a combination. It's worth it right across from your new civil. It's worth getting off the freeway to see. That's because you got reclaimed. No water, you don't have beauty. And I think that's our challenge now, because we, even though we're going to, are we supposed to get more water next year, says the Fritz and everybody? 65% or... chance of El Nino, but I wouldn't bet on it. Yeah, I got it. But still, we've got to change our ways. But Reclaim gives us the extension. Reclaim, <laughs> Reclaim is overtime, like at a football game. You can play more. We just got to win and get more of it. Thank you. That's right. All right, well, we'll continue the item per Mr. Weezer's request for 30 days, and we'll see you all back. I don't see any public general public comment cards. Oh, nope. General public comment cards. With that, we're adjourned. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair.